The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.thebenjamindixonshow.com to register for our blog and join the Progressive Army. Welcome to the Benjamin Dixon Show. I am your host, Benjamin Dixon. Today is Tuesday, April 28, 2020. Thanks so much for joining us. There is a lot going on in the news, but, you know, the news isn't changing right now. Um, And so today I'm not going to cover anything that's happening in the news. Uh, What I am going to do is bring to you an interview um, with none other than Professor Eddie Glaud. You may know him from MSNBC, Time Magazine, um, various outlets. Uh, Professor Glaude is the chair of the Department of African-American Studies and the James S. McDonald Distinguished University Professor of African-American Studies at Princeton University. He will be joining us momentarily. Um, I also have a portion of the interview from uh, Professor Adolph Reed of University of Pennsylvania um, that I did not include in yesterday's public show. And because that portion, that portion of the interview is really important. I'm going to include it in this public episode as well. So if I were to give you a uh, syllabus for today's episode, uh, Professor Eddie Glaude, um, we're going to get as much of his interview in this public episode. The full interview, as always, will be available to patrons, unedited, uncut, um, as well as embedded in today's episode so that you can consume it however you choose. Um, Also, uh, this episode will include the final portion of the interview with Professor Adolph Reed. And I just have to say, I've had both of them on the show before, but there is absolutely nothing better to me <laughs> than an intellectually stimulating conversation, particularly with some, I mean, some brothers who shake the foundations of the intellectual world. These are some great minds, great thinkers, and I'm honored to have them on the show. Um, so let's begin with Professor Eddie Glaude. Professor Glaude, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I know it's a hectic time uh, around the country, in fact, around the world. So before I even begin, I just want to check and see how are you holding up, all things considered. You know, we're I'm taking advantage of the time to be still. Uh, mm. Uh, my my prayers are with all of those who are, are, are struggling with this virus and who have lost loved ones. Uh, but, you know, trying to take advantage of the moment, the, you know, the quiet, the hush. Yeah. Yeah. And to just kind of make sense of everything. But the family's doing well. We're, we're blessed. Uh, and, and our parents are, are doing well. We finally convinced them to shelter in place. You know how it is. Ooh, so. <laughs> it, it's uh, some of the hardest people to convince were uh, my family members. So, oh, uh, absolutely not. <laughs> So I feel like that's an achievement in itself. Um, so there's a lot happening around the world. And uh, I know you have a new book out. I definitely want to talk to you. I had a chance to kind of crash read it is what I call it. Um, and, and I found it extremely fascinating. I want to get to that. But, you know, you you are on MSNBC on a regular basis. You have commentary there. You have commentary. I've seen you in Time magazine as well as all your thoughts on Twitter. Um what is your gut instinct with regards to, <clears throat> excuse me, the coronavirus and the leadership that we have in Washington, D.C. right now, namely uh, Donald Trump? Um, how do you feel about our odds here? <laughs> well, you know, I'm not um, terribly confident in our leadership. Uh, you know, I think what the coronavirus has done, what COVID-19 has done uh, is ha- kind of reveal all of the fissures and breakages uh, that were uh, existent before. Uh, the virus or the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Our democracy was in trouble, was in profound trouble. I, you know, Reverend Barber says COVID-19 works like a contrast dye, mm. shows us where the sickness is. Right. Um, and what it has revealed um, is the bankruptcy of an ideology uh, that has in some ways had the country by the throat for 40 years. Mm. Um, and, you know, from its conception of, of, of the, you know, federal government is nothing but uh, a kind of burden on liberty and choice to uh, its interest uh, solely being uh, lining the pockets of the top 1% and the top one-tenth of a percent. We see all of that at work right now, while the most vulnerable, the marginal, uh, those who live in the shadows are in some ways bearing the burden of the virus. They, We are dying. They yeah. are dying uh, at phenomenal rates. And so... Um, it's revealing in some ways, Ben, that, 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 that you know, this empire is on its last legs. Mm, mm. That's the terrifying thing to me, because the handwriting is on the wall. 
Um, it seems like this virus is uniquely tuned to exploit all of our weaknesses and all of our arrogance um, yeah. and all the ways that we are intentionally obtuse, um, the, the level of ignorance that we thrive in and revel in, uh, both politically and socially. Um, when you say the empire is on its last legs, I mean, I, I can't imagine anything else being as efficient as COVID-19 in terms of uh, weakening us uh, and exploiting us at our very weakest points. Yeah. You know, I mean, when I say the empire is on its last legs, you know, I'm thinking about it in a, in a broad sense mm -hmm. you know, the kind of post-World War II consensus uh, that has in some ways defined uh, the global landscape uh, with America's leadership uh, has collapsed and it has collapsed uh, not only because of, of the pandemic uh, or it's collapsing, it is it, 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 it has been in some ways under assault by the ideology of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. it, uh, Trumpism is a part of this wave of reactionary, conservative, borderline fascist, in some place explicitly fascist ideologies uh, that reflect in some ways the bankruptcy of, of an economic philosophy that has left working people in precarious situations. So what, yeah. what, what, what the pandemic has done in so many ways, Ben, just, just to kind of put a, a pin on this, uh, it's exposed, right, the contradictions of an economic reality that, that we were all living and experiencing. Mm. Um, and now the question will be, and it is a pressing question, do we have the imagination and courage to imagine right. ourselves otherwise? Right. Uh, and that's the challenge. Yeah. Like, and, 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 you know, for, if I suffer from anything, any ailment that I suffer from, it's this, um, idealism, this, um, almost to the point of naivete, because at the beginning of this, I saw it as an opportunity for America to change its ways <laughs> and for them, for us to successfully survive this pandemic. There were some things that we just inextricably needed to do without question. We needed to institute some type of universal basic income, no matter what level it was. We just needed something. We needed to uh, put a moratorium on debts, uh, on foreclosures and, and uh, evictions more specifically. And, um, and instead of doing any of those things, we decided to give, uh, we being the federal government and our elected officials, decided to pour trillions into the markets and to millionaires and billionaires and give but a pittance to um, the average American. And so it looks to me like my, na my naivete and my idealism is met with this brutish reality about America that it really just does not give a damn about the people. Right. I think it's really important. You used a verb that, that I think we need to really underline, and that is decided. Mm -hmm. You know, there, we didn't choose the virus, but we're making choices day in and day out, right? Um, when we look at what Europe has done, when we look at what Germany has decided to do, right. uh, what other European countries have decided to do, they did not decide uh, to choose mass unemployment. They did not choose uh, uh, starvation for its population, where you have thousands, like we saw in San Antonio, lining up for food banks. Right? They decided that they were going to pay corporations not to lay off their uh, workers, that they were going to, in some ways, subsidize payroll, right? Mm. Yeah. And what did what have we been doing? Right. Like you said, uh, the country has decided that, uh, uh, you know, you know, big business is what really matters, yeah. that everyday ordinary folk can get by on twelve hundred dollars. Right. Um, that uh, and then we see this clamoring to reopen our economy, uh, which is an invitation to the grave mm. in my to my mind, especially for our folk. Um, and so you're right. What is being revealed is what folks value. These folks don't care about everyday ordinary people. Right. They only care about, you know, money. Yeah. They only care about their greed. Uh, and that's in full view. And we need to call it for what it is. And I just I, I don't imagine. And again, this could be maybe I haven't been around the block enough. Uh, this this year, just full transparency, this year has been uh, the last uh, 18 months has been about accepting the play, my blind spots. And my blind spots really come in when I try to be optimistic. Um, and I hate to say it like that, but it seems like when I have a more pessimistic view of things, it's a, it's a clearer picture. And so in my mind, I would hope 
that the people, the masses, the electorate, the body politic would see what's being put on full display and become um, agitated enough to actually do something about it. But that generally isn't the case throughout world history, particularly uh, American history. There's only the rarest occasion of occasions that we rise up to address the abuses of the ruling elite. I want to know how do you feel about it? Do you feel how do you feel? You bullish or bearish on whether or not the people will have something to say about these um, these the the disgusting display of inequality that's right before us. Yeah, you know, I, I you know I, I'm reminded of a phrase from Antonio Gramsci, the Italian Marxist. Right, we must have optimism of the will and pessimism of the intellect. Right. Mm. Um, so I think I'm I'm hopeful. I have to be. That keeps me out of my liquor cabinet. <laughs> Uh, that everyday ordinary folk uh, will uh, recognize that uh, the current way in which uh, the country, the current direction of the country is 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 not good. Right. Uh, that that they see that it's not just simply Donald Trump. That Mitch McConnell and and the Republican Party and and in some ways the corporate wing of the Democratic Party have in some ways led us down this path. And that we need to to be bolder in how we respond uh, to our circumstances, but that's going to require, I think, not just simply a faith, Benjamin, in 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 folk to make the right choice, but it's going to require, I think, clear uh, and concise arguments as to why we need to choose to be otherwise. Um, in some ways, to have folk clamoring for the no- for, you know for normalcy clamoring for, you know, pre-Trump uh, uh, stability, all of that in some ways sets us up uh, for a, a, a kind of truncated imagination. Yeah. Uh, what we need to do is look boldly forward and not uh, seek security by looking backward. Mm. And I think that's, that's really important for us in this moment. So I, I have faith that we will choose to be otherwise, but we have to make the argument. Right. We have to put forward the visions uh, to give folk a sense that they need to take this step forward and not just seek comfort and security in the face of this crisis. Mm. Wow. Professor Glad, I want you to hold that thought right there. We'll pick up right on that after we come back from um, thanking all of our supporters, what we call our patron party. All right. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon show. Here we go. Very special welcome and thank you to all of our newest patrons without whom this show is not possible. Welcome aboard to Robin Mine, or I'm sorry, Robin Milne. Let's just say Robin M. Thanks so much for becoming a a patron. Hunter Hess, thank you for becoming a patron. James, thank you for becoming a patron. Carol Wald, thank you for becoming a patron. Justin Smith, thank you, sir, for becoming a patron. And Jake uh, S. We're going to go with Jake S. Thank you so much for becoming a patron. Everybody celebrate all the people who helped make this show possible just for a few minutes here. Here we go. You too can become a part of this prestigious and prodigious patron family by going to patreon.com forward slash the BPD show where you get twice the content, exclusive interviews without any of the annoying advertisements like you're unfortunately going to hear right here. Welcome back to the Benjamin Dixon show. Visit us online at www.thebenjamindixonshow.com. Wow. Wow. You mentioned there the corporate wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, I can't leave them out. And I know you historically have never left them out. Uh, You've always held them to task. Um, uh, I want to know how do you feel Here's my assessment, and I want to get your thoughts on it. Uh, I feel like there's a a vacuum in leadership in this critical moment where we have 26 million Americans who are unemployed um, and no one from the Democratic Party, you know, uh, uh, um, let's say the higher echelons, like top tier figures, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, um, uh, any of them are standing out there pounding the pavement on behalf of all of these people who are being crushed by this crisis. 
Um, and I feel like it's an abdication of duty, but I also feel like it might be somewhat intentional. What are your thoughts? You know, I, I you know, I've been longing for uh, statesmen and stateswomen to step forward and to offer uh, uh, big picture ideas. Uh, you know, the phased, uh, uh, you know, this incremental help, the phased legislation yeah. uh, um, is, is just, is, is helping, but it's, it's, it's not really, it's like a bandaid for, for gunshot wound. Yeah. Uh, it's not really doing the work. We know that, that, that folk are hemorrhaging uh, across the country and, 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 you know, you just can't put, you know, witch hazel on <laughs> these wounds, you know. Uh, and so, you know, we, this is the thing, right? There, there are moments, this pandemic in the history of the country stands out uh, in light of other crises, other moments. We had the crisis of the Civil War. We had the crisis of the Great Depression. Yeah. Uh, we had the crisis of World War II, and we had the crisis of the, mid, uh, of the Black freedom struggle mm-hmm. uh, in the mid-20th century. And in each one of those moments, there were bold, imaginative leaps imaginative steps in response. The modern U.S. nation state came into existence as a result of the Civil War. Right. Right. The New Deal was the res- as flawed as it was. It, it was. it was the response to the devastation of, uh, uh, of the Great Depression. And we know what happened post, uh, you know, in the context of the civil rights of the Black freedom struggle of the mid-20th century. So what we need from folk, and, and so this is, the short answer is that I'm very disappointed. I, we we need to stop. Uh, uh, I know we have to talk about the you know the grind, uh, the details, the the weeds of of the legislative process, but we need folk to kind of put forward you know bold visions. We need talk of a UBI. We need talk of Medicaid uh, unhinging healthcare from employment. We need we need bold visions, and I'm not hearing that as if the pandemic doesn't require it. Yeah. The scale of the pandemic requires an imaginative response that is equal to the scale of the of the catastrophe. Right. And I don't see that happening right now, if that makes sense. No, that's oh. that's the disappointing part about this entire uh, experience where we have historically uh, in great moments of crises, we have had to rise to the occasion, even if we uh, certain sectors of the uh, of the body politic didn't want to. For our survival, we had to. And it seems like in 2020, we're doing the exact opposite. Uh, And I think it's a a combination of both Donald Trump being in the White House um, and bringing his level of ignorance to the world uh, and exploiting that level of ignorance that I think exists probably in all of us. But we we don't you know, we don't indulge in it. Donald Trump indulges in it and gives permission to the rest of the world and or America to indulge in it. And then I also think it's a, a combination of. The leadership in the Democratic Party not wanting to do those things like, you know, I think it's a fundamental transformation of of the uh, economy that we have to undertake to survive this. And I think the corporate wing of the Democratic Party is um, not really interested in going that far. I feel like and and, and feel free to uh, agree, disagree. I just want to know your thoughts. But I, I feel like America is pushing us um, is is really playing a game of chicken with this virus seeing how far we can go without actually changing before we blink. You know, that I haven't thought about it in that way, but I do, I, I tend to agree with, with, with the analogy. Um, it seems as if uh, uh, they, some among us uh, in our national leadership, uh, want to hold on to the fundamentals of a particular economic reality. Yeah. Uh, no matter what, or an economic philosophy, no matter what the pandemic is revealing about our society, the depth of inequality and its consequences, th- those who are committed to uh, a certain kind of neoliberal philosophy continue to hold on to its base assumption. Yeah. Uh, and they don't want to give those up uh, at all. Yeah. Um, and, and it seems to me that what is being revealed very clearly um, is that we need to do something different. Um, 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 and <laughs> how can I put this? There's a, um, it, it, it just, let me just, let me just say, uh, Ben, it's, it's, it's tragic that, that because of folks commitment, uh, to greed, mm-hmm. 
Uh, mm. That folk are dying unnecessarily. Yes. And they've been dying unnecessarily for a while prior to COVID-19. I've got I've got a whole lot more coming up with Professor Eddie Glaude. Um, we'll be talking about his book um, that I actually had a chance to get a hold of and and I've been reading it and it is phenomenal uh, coming up this Thursday. You and I've already retweeted it. I'm going to share more about it. Um, but this Thursday, he is doing a live reading um, of his book, a live stream. Uh, the book is entitled Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its earnest uh, his urgent lessons for our own. Um, he's going to be doing that reading this Thursday, April 30th. 1 p.m. He'll be doing it live on Twitter at 3 p.m. He'll be doing it live on Facebook and at uh, 7 p.m. He'll be doing it live on Instagram. It's a lot of reading, Professor. I'll, I'll send you a link on how to read it once and then have it <laughs> distributed across all the platforms. But no, seriously, the book, um, I'm going to put a portion of that interview about his book here in the live episode today. So don't go anywhere. This is going to be a little longer episode. I still owe you the audience because I uh, pre appreciate you so much. And because the conversation that I had with Professor Adolph Reed was very rigorous, I still owe you this final portion of uh, the interview with Professor Adolph Reed. Um, so I'm going to give you that here uh, and then stay tuned. Don't go anywhere because we're going to do a little bit of Professor Glaude's book um, right in this public episode. However, if you would like, the unedited, uncut, full 45 to an hour, minutes to an hour interview without having to go through, you know, the rest of the show and the commercials and the all the other stuff. Just go to patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and the raw file. Ask the patrons. When I say it's the raw file, there's nothing cut from it. <laughs> so uh, you can get access to that by becoming a patron. Um, but I just want to make sure I give you as much as I can publicly. And for patrons, obviously stay tuned after the closing music, you will get, uh, the rest of the book interview today. And when I tell you again, the book interview, I just, there's nothing more refreshing than having an intellectual conversation, especially in these very ignorant times in which we live. Okay. But no, um, his book really I think because of what he chose to discuss, his book really cuts to the core of some critical lessons that we need to learn, not only to survive individually, collectively, but also damn near as a species. Um, it really cuts to the core of some things. So you definitely want to be there on Thursday for his live reading and you definitely want to uh, become a patron so you can get the rest of that full interview unedited and you can just experience it in its totality. Um, but as always, I will find a way to make sure that I include um, everything in the public episode over the next few days. All right, let's get back to Professor Adolf Reed. And I had some questions of him uh, regarding the VP pick of Joe Biden. So I'm, so I'm going to play a clip of Stacey Abrams on with Jake Tapper. And immediately after that clip, you're going to hear me asking a question of Professor Adolf Reed about his position in terms of the vice presidential pick uh, for Joe Biden. You definitely want to hear his answer on this. Take a listen in. I've asked Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer and, and New Mexico Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham about uh, the possibility of being Biden's running mate over the last few weeks. They both took the more traditional path for possible VP nominees by playing coy to a degree. You're taking a different strategy when it comes to this. You're, you're openly advocating for yourself to be picked to be the running mate. Why? I would say this. I've been asked this question since last year. I was brought into the national conversation and I've been very honest about my willingness to serve. As a young black woman growing up in Mississippi, I learned that if you don't raise your hand, people won't see you and they won't give you attention. But it's not about attention for being the running mate. It is about making sure that my qualifications aren't in question because they're not just speaking to me. They're speaking to young black women, young women of color, young people of color, who wonder if they too can be seen. My responsibility is to follow the process if I'm included. Mm -hmm. And I trust that Joe Biden and his team are going to put together a process that will pick the best running mate for him. 
because fundamentally it's his choice. Mm -hmm. What I try to do is tell the truth and be direct, but I understand that there is a process that Mm -hmm. will be at work and that he has no shortage of qualified candidates to choose from. Professor Reed, I like the way you put it here uh, in your piece in The New Republic. You said it's vital, in other words, to recognize that the politics of racial representation was from the first uh, a class politics. Right. One in which actual black people disappeared as little more than a communitarian abstraction. Once this dramatic cleavage was uh, affected, the interests of the black majority could be confidently ventriloquized uh, by an emerging stratum of race relation administrators who were also aligned with and embedded as minions of ruling class power. And here we are. Precisely right. what we saw happening in um in south carolina and yeah. quite frankly uh across the south particularly on super tuesday and here we are faced with um joe biden now who needs all the help that he possibly can get and there seems to be a lot of jockeying and positioning for the vp spot um for some type of uh minimum representation uh, they stacy abrams Clamoring right. for the uh, VP spot. And then you have the Kamala Harris's fans who are really pushing her in that right. spot. And I don't want to make this episode particularly about beating up on our black elite and the black <laughs> representation. But I do just kind of want to see what you feel about that. Um, right. That VP spot being for a black woman and the calculation that's going on there. Well, you know what, man? Like, it's funny you asked me about that, because uh, about an hour ago, uh, I saw an article, I think it was in the New York Times, uh, about this, uh, about Abrams. And I should ask ask you, maybe you tell me after I, 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 I finish my uh, you know, response. I didn't realize it was a beef between um, her and Keisha Bottoms and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, Reed. Uh, but, um, but, but I read that, and my first thought was, and, and and it's not exactly um, comparable, but you know I I had an uncle who's a Tuskegee Airman oh. who, who was shot down at the Battle of the Bulge, spent the rest of the war in a German POW camp, mm-hmm. where for the only since he was a ranking officer uh, among the American prisoners for the only time in World War II he commanded white troops, mm. uh, and I thought. Well, and the reason that my uncle Mac popped into my head was that um, was that this article just seemed so tone deaf, right? Mm-hmm. About you know the magnitude of the political moment that we're in and that we're facing, right? Uh, with with uh, Trump and the prospect of another four four years, that if Stacey Abrams seems to be clamoring to be Vice president of 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 the concentration camp, right? And then I said, "Well, POW camp is not the same thing as a concentration camp." Right. And my uncle Mac wasn't trying to get shot down, <laughs> but, but uh, but I mean, the idea. See, I mean, this says something about what's happened to politics among Black Americans, right? That the idea that what we need to be concerned about is whether a Black woman gets a vice presidential nomination, right? Quite apart from, you know, um, uh, uh, questions of what does she bring to the ticket? I, I mean, in the first place, you know, all this stuff about um, um, energizing, like, the black base. Yeah. It, so. I think that's done at this point. I, I don't think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And. And 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 plus, I hate to be like this about it, but um, what percentage are black voters of of the electorate anyway? Right. Right. I mean, it's not like, um, you, you know, that's that's what puts a candidate over the top. Right. I mean, it's all about jockeying and positioning for um, um, individuals. And it doesn't seem and whether we, we should be rooting for. For um, the Stacey Abrams or Kamala Harris, to me, is is as meaningless as whether we should be rooting for um, for a black filmmaker like to win an Oscar. Right. 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 And I don't care about that either. Right. <laughs> me, me either. Because because here's the thing: it's it's like we have gotten to a place with um, 
And, and, and again, I, I, I like the distinction that you make. When you talk about the black vote, it's as meaningless as talking about the Canadian vote, right, in terms of size. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so when I talk about uh, this, I don't want to apply what I'm getting ready to say. I'm not trying to apply it to all black politics because not all black politics operates like the black misleadership class. But the black misleadership class politics, they seem to be completely satisfied with just sheer representation without anything in regards to like what this ticket is going to do for uh, humanity in general, Americans specifically and black Americans even more uh, precisely. So it's, it's almost like if you just give us a face up there, we will throw all of our support behind you. When right. there are millions more uh, black Americans who don't even participate because they got tired, they they just have this gut feeling that this system ain't going to do shit for them anyway. Right. Well, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And then there's another aspect of it, too. I'm mean, just on top of that. That's that's like. Demanding a better seat at the closer to the captain's table on the right. fucking Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean. <laughs> don't you notice right that what's going on outside <laughs> I, was, I, didn't, I didn't expect that i i was satisfied with the analogy stopping at the captain's seat and <laughs> you threw us on the, you threw us on the ti- titanic which is exactly a, right do they not see what's happening outside i mean 69 percent of americans asking for medicare for all isn't just right. because it's a catchy name right people right. understand the, their their situation and then when you have 26 right. million americans that are unemployed and literally nobody, I mean, not a single politician in Washington, D.C. is making hay over that. And and right. this is one of those rare occasions where your righteous indignation can align with all of your best politics, all of your best political machinations, no, that's right. you know, and nobody is seizing the moment around that. So I am curious, like they are they really would prefer a seat at the table next to the captain on the Titanic versus right. looking outside the window and seeing all of the meaningful politics they could be engaged in. Well, and say, I think that's part of it because they really don't, don't believe that's happening. And I mean, there was a moment like this after Reagan was elected, right? When, um, cause you know, Nixon, like in 68 and in 72, but especially first time around, um, uh, sent out shockwaves through the black, uh, you know, the new black, um, I mean, political class. Mm-hmm. And then it turned out that, I mean, Nixon was prepared to negotiate with them. Right. Right. And I think when Reagan was elected, they kind of thought the same thing was going to happen. And the problem was that Reagan figured out that that 40 years ago, they didn't really have a base, right, that they could mobilize because because their whole claim claim to fame basically is demobilizing a a base. Right. Mm. Um. And, expound, and when, I don't mean to cut you off, but expound on that a little bit. Uh, demobilizing the base. What right. was what, how did they come to that conclusion? And yeah, to speak on that a little more. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean that. Um, so yeah, after the Voting Rights Act, uh, and when I was in Atlanta, right, and I lived in Atlanta during uh, the transition in, in, uh, in uh, the racial transition, like in local politics, mm-hmm. and a line from the rising stratum of black elected officials and it was true everywhere was that you can elect us now so mm. that so that you don't have to do all that e- extraneous protest mm. stuff which was right and good up to a point right i mean because it would get tiresome every time you needed to get a zoning variance to get a driveway cut cut to your house or or a cul-de-sac laid you had to go yeah you know, have a demonstration right, right before the council right um so it, so part of the victory was um, was the emergence and consolidation of a routine politics that black Americans had access to yeah. in ways that they didn't before. Yeah. Flip side of that is that um, you know, the routine, you know, having access to r- routine politics kind of uh, you know, reduces, um, you know, the inclination to mobilize. Right. Um, and as, as black elected officials, right, um, come, uh, you become in incumbents. Well, we learn that in incumbency is its own racial characteristic in the sense that all incumbents, no matter what, what else, gender, race, age, age, whatever, 
have a number one interest in being reelected, which means uh, you know, depressing voter turnout to yeah. as close a number as they can get to their family and people on their payrolls <laughs> right, right, as possible. Uh, at the national level, um, you know, the um, um, emergence of the new black political class was tied up with with um, in, in, in implicit promise um, to um, preempt disruptions. Right. 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 And I mean, you remember, right? I mean, late 60s, early 70s, there were a bunch of disruptions. Right. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so that's what they did all through. You know the Nixon years, um, uh, and I mean the Carter years. Reagan comes around. I mean, God, like uh, I, I mean the Urban League, and I think maybe even Operation Push were actually line items in in a Carter uh, training budget, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Reagan comes along, and the Reaganites figured out that these people didn't have a popular base, and they moved against them, and like our our black black elite was like kind of caught out basically. Well, since then, Clintonism has Don't has in other point. ways helped incorporate blacks, and and it's fascinating to consider too that how Bill Clinton rose to the presidency partly by beating up, uh, largely by beating up on on poor black people, right? And and now Clintonism since '08. Uh, has been all about in encouragement of, uh, of of a racial identity policy, right. right? So, like when HRC said infamously in 2016, um, you know, my opponent want, wants to break up the big banks. How's but, that going to end racism? Yeah, um, I mean, to which I said, yeah, well, it wouldn't end the heartbreak of psoriasis either. But that's not really the point. It would do a lot for black people, <clears throat> right? Um, so, but so I mean that's just um, a little irony. But so now I mean I think, and look I mean I was just thinking about this in respect to South Carolina a couple of days ago. One of the black le- legislators in the state, a guy named Daryl Jackson, um, is in trouble now um, for allegedly having diverted a half a million dollars uh, from in state funds that went to. Um, a development, uh, a nonprofit, uh, I mean, development operation that's connected to the church that he pastors, mm. right? And it may be legit. I don't know. I mean, it, if I had to bet, I would bet there's not. But, but what struck me about it was it. Oh yeah, this is how this thing works, right? I mean, this is how, right? Because for him to be able to do that, right? The Democrats are a minority in the state. The legislature, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you know, the governor is a Republican, right? Right, but these guys have have worked out modus vivendi with the right wing that's in power, right? Um, and that they get their deals cut, right? And it's all Jake at that level. I mean, that's why uh, my good friend and comrade and colleague Wibbly Leggett and I have had like a thirty year argument going as to whether. The, which is the worst black political class in 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 the U.S. Is it in Louisiana or is it in South Carolina? <laughs> and 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 uh, we go back and forth, and every time one of us pulls ahead, right? I mean, the other, um, well, with the clowns in in the other one state, I mean, do something to get back in contention for the, <laughs> yeah. the crowd. So, we'll make it up, put us together. We'll make it up, you put us together. We'll make it up, you put us together. Okay, we're back. Professor Glaude, I want to point to something um, that you're that you're working on and that you're endeavoring in now. Um, I've had the, the privilege of reading your uh, a lot of your previous works, um, but you have a new book out. It's called Begin Again. James Baldwin, James James Baldwin's America and its urgent lessons for our own um, and for our listeners. You will be doing a live stream reading uh, this Thursday on Twitter, uh, on Facebook, and on Instagram. Um, I will share the uh, graphics so that they can get the times and oh, and sure. and be there because I'll definitely be there because I've had the privilege 
I don't even know if I if I'm supposed to say that I actually <laughs> read some. I don't know if that's permissible. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, okay. Okay. So I've read, I've read some of it and, and I want to just dig into it. Like we did your last book, democracy sure, in black. Sure. Um, and forever, however long you have, uh, we could be brief, but here's, a, here's something out of the introduction. I, I have a couple of paragraphs that you wrote and I just want to kind of uh, pick your brain on them. This is in from the introduction of the book. You said to be sure the idea of America is, is in deep trouble. Though many will find consolation in the principles of our founders or the resilience of our American story, the fact remains that we stand on a knife's edge. Donald Trump's presidency unleashed forces howling beneath our politics since the tumult of the 1960s. For decades, politicians stoked and exploited white resentment. Corporations consolidated their hold on government and cut off the knees of American workers. Ideas of the public good were reduced to an unrelenting pursuit of self-interest. And you continue on from there. I, I feel like that paragraph um, succinctly identifies not only the sickness that America had, but like you said, it's being exploited in COVID-19. But these problems existed before COVID-19. No, absolutely. You know, um, so the book was initially supposed to come out um, on April 21st. Mm -hmm. uh, but because of COVID-19, we had to push back the pub date and we pushed it back to August 4th. and. I just wanted to share some of some of the words, uh, some of my thoughts um, in the interim, because I think uh, Baldwin's response to his own disappointment, to the assassination of Dr. King, to the ascent of Ronald Reagan, offers us resources to respond to the darkness of our own moment. Mm. And the first thing that you have to do, I think, Benjamin, is tell the truth, is to bear witness to exactly who we are. And what you just read is, in some ways, my uh, description of the last 40 to 50 years. Right? We've had an economic approach. You can call it trickle-down economics. You can call it Reaganomics. You can call it neoliberalism, whatever you want to call it, right? that believes that you know, everyday ordinary workers, that labor isn't the most important thing. Hmm. Those who, who, who are the so-called producers, those who, you know, those who who are are the type one top one percent uh, those hedge fund managers those folks matter more than other folks right and what they've done in order to shift the balance right is to kind of stoke hatreds and fears to play on people's uh, sense of vulnerability and to to scapegoat um, and what we've what we've seen at least over the course of my lifetime uh, is a party and politicians across party, right, playing on people's racist hatreds uh, and fear. Mm. And, it has, and it has led us to this moment. It has led us to this moment. Um, we know that they've eroded the social safety net. We know what they've said about, uh, you know, social programs like, uh, you know, quote unquote, welfare and, and, yeah. and, and food stamps and unemployment insurance. We know what has happened over the last 40 years as a particular political ideology, right, in the hands of Republicans and triangulated by DLC Democrats and their uh, children and children's children. Hmm. They have, in effect, right, left the most vulnerable exposed. And now we have a virus that is literally running through, right, the most vulnerable among us. So I wanted to, to kind of, uh, in that in that passage, um, just lay bare what I think has been done. And the fact is, and I said it earlier, Benjamin, folk have chosen to do that. Yeah, it yeah. wasn't inevitable. Right, right. That's the that's the that's the depressing part about this. That this was a decision. These were an, an active set of decisions to look at our situation and say, mm, let's just keep doing what we've been doing, no matter what it costs in human life, um, which kind of seamlessly segues to another passage that really struck me. You were talking about James Baldwin uh, and his understanding of the American condition. This is what you wrote. You said, quote, Baldwin's understanding of the American condition cohered around a set of practices that taken together constitute something I will refer to throughout this book as the lie. The idea of facing of facing the lie was always at the heart of Jimmy's witness. Jimmy, obviously referring to James Baldwin, um, because he thought that because he thought that it 
as opposed to our claim to the shiny, shining city on the hill was what made America truly exceptional. The lie is more properly several sets of lies with a single purpose. If what I have called the value gap is the idea that in America, white lives have always mattered more than the lives of others, then the lie is the broad and powerful architecture of false assumptions by which the value gap is maintained. Tell me about the lie. You know, we tell us we tell ourselves the story as Americans that we are an example of democracy achieved. Mm. We tell ourselves the story that. We embody a certain kind of virtue that is uh, evidenced in our commitment to freedom and liberty. And we do so in such a way that we turn a blind eye. We might might call it willful ignorance or Mm. what Baldwin described as a kind of, uh, you know, innocence. Hmm. We turn a blind eye to all of the ugliness that we've done and that we are doing. We're like uh, Peter Pan in Never Never Land. (laughs) Right with the lost boys, they never want to grow up because they don't ever want to be held accountable and responsible. Mm. So, so there's this kind of perpetual adolescence that defines the country. So, when we talk about, you know, uh, the blood that's in the soil yeah. of the nation, uh, that we're, you know, that settler colonialism is at the heart of the founding of the country and the, and the violence perpetrated against Native peoples. When we think about the horror of slavery, when we think about um, uh, the violence of Jim Crow, when we think about um, what we've done in the Philippines and, and what we've done in Puerto Rico and in and Haiti, and when we think about uh, that we are the only country in the history of the world to use the atomic bomb, when right. we think about the violence, right, uh, we have to tell ourselves a different story about who we are, right? That is to say, this willful innocence, this willful ignorance protects the lie Hmm. that we are an example of democracy achieved, that we are, right, embodied, that we embody political virtue. Uh, And what Jimmy wants to say, or what Baldwin, I call him Jimmy because, you know, writing this book, it's not about Baldwin, it's me thinking with him. Hmm. He's like a walking partner. And I must admit, Benjamin, I barely survived because he's an exacting walking partner. He Hmm. asks so much of you. He demands a certain kind of honesty in you right. if you're going to demand the honesty that the nation be honest. You know, Baldwin says, in effect, that, you know, the messiness of our own interior lives evidences itself in the messiness of our social arrangement. Huh. So you got to deal with the ugliness on the inside of yourself so that you can deal with the ugliness in the world. And so this, this, this demand for an honest confrontation with who we are, right, is necessary. It's a precondition for imagining ourselves otherwise. If you lie to yourself, if you say that you're this, then you can't change. You're stuck. You're trapped. So part of what we have to do, and I talk about this in the book, using 1619 Project, using uh, the lynching memorial in Montgomery, Right, reaching for examples of a different kind of story that we can tell ourselves, not to beat ourselves up with our past sins, but to displace the idea that we're always on the road to a more perfect union. Mm. Because that ideology, right, American perfectionism, right, that ideology is so efficient in protecting us from the ugliness that we do. Mm. Mm. Right. And so that that moment, the lie. Right, the yeah. lie keeps us from looking uh, all that blood and carnage squarely in the face. So many amazing thoughts that um, I get a chance to explore with Professor Eddie Gloud. 
um, that you can hear and get access to after this closing music. If you're a patron, stay tuned. If not, go to patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and become a patron so you can get all of this amazing content. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for being a beautiful audience. I really appreciate you and I will see you next time. Take care, everybody. The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show and support the Benjamin Dixon show. If you like this episode, be sure to share, like, and subscribe.